moment. I do believe that it's very much, um, we need to be very much aware where we stand and uh, how we need to progress in the future. Um, I'm Senida Messi, former Deputy Prime Minister in Albania, a former Member of Parliament, and um, actually I'm dealing um, with uh, more into the regional context of Western Balkan um, uh, region, into the democratization, political issues, but even sustainable developing goals, together with sustainable developing network solution. Uh, with the famous professor Jeffrey Sachs in um, Columbia University, just to give a little bit the idea and to work a little bit together in the region and all together, both in the two sides. So democratization and uh, working more into the um, uh, civil society and politics to work together, but not to forgive in any moment the sustainable economic growth, inclusion, and um, definitely more um, social justice as well. So even in the theme that we are going to discuss in the coming um, minutes, after all the panelists represent themselves and probably for sure, I will focus a little bit more in the political and economical situation of Western Balkans and the influence of uh, mostly China and Serbia in the region, even though European Union is very much close to us and is the biggest investor in our region. Great, thanks very much. Who would like to go next? <laughs> go for it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy to speak. Thanks, everybody. Um, and thank you, Sunita, for sharing your your perspective, uh, being so near this nightmare uh, situation. Uh, we stand with the people of Ukraine here in the United States. It's uh, traumatic to watch. Um, my name is Joel Rubin. I'm a, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. I served in the Obama administration and um, have worked in Washington for a couple of decades uh, in political work and national security uh, and congressional work as well. I, I have to tell you, so I've been on television throughout the night because of this attack, this illegal war crime uh, attack against a nuclear facility to terrorize the Ukrainian people. We've all already been traumatized by Chernobyl to beat them into submission. Um, so um, I'm going to be very raw in my comments. I apologize in advance. Um, one of the things that, and, and I, I've worked in international development as well for a number of years and, and actually started my career as a Peace Corps volunteer overseas in the mid 90s. So I deeply believe in the intersection of development and democracy, progress, environmental sustainability, all of that comes together. The SDGs are the beautiful embodiment of that uh, vision. And we are living right now in the midst of three, um, three nightmare uh, scenarios of, of, of global existential consequence. Um, we're living in a, a moment where we are still in a pandemic, kind of coming out of it, but not really out of it at all. We have climate change uh, fears that are legitimate that are right here right now and accelerating and of course now we have the specter of nuclear war back on our plate uh and and these transnational threats are always present while at the same time the the need is there to lift up developing countries and uh, uh middle-income countries to help them accelerate and so all of this is coming together, uh, uh, oddly, paradoxically, at this moment. Clearly, um, it, it's present in the minds of our young people as well. And um, I don't say I have all the solutions. I'm not going to talk like that uh, this morning, except to say that I think right now, from the American perspective, uh, there is a, a heightened awareness uh, of the, the these these existential threats. And they are damaging in many ways, our public square. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, but very much um, frustratingly, uh, certainly in our political environment, we are seeing greater polarization right now than ever uh, in living memory, certainly of mine, um, and maybe since prior to World War II, when we also had extraordinary polarization. So how we grapple then with these issues and these threats is harder. Uh, as a result of this polarization and the, the 
the splitting to the extremes in our politics uh, make solutions that are evidence-based and rooted in, in um, empirical data harder to achieve. So that's, that's a, a lot of where I work is sort of this political environment on these issues. And um, I'm happy to talk about that as we, as we dialogue. Yeah, full agenda. And I think our heart goes to everyone that is suffering from any type of attack. But uh, this is why this, 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 this channeling support uh, from strong country to a weaker country is happening through these things. So, there is floor is yours. So thank you very much. Uh, so I have to fully agree to that what was uh, shared and what was said. And exactly we are facing kind of turning point, I think, right now. Also, we got to take into consideration that uh, there are a few crises that we've got right now because we've got like health crisis, we've got like uh, social crisis as well. We've got economic kind of economic crisis in some countries and some areas of the world. And as well, uh, we are facing the climate crisis. So a lot of things that are overlapping and we have at the same time. So it's, it's really bad thing. And actually it's a turning point and a big challenge for the entire humanity. And as well, we've got a very terrible, uh, completely without any sense, the war in Ukraine. Actually, we are the neighbor in Poland, the neighbor of Ukraine. So far, we've admitted more than 600,000 refugees from Ukraine. And actually, for sure, there will uh, come m many more. And actually, we don't know what to do. I mean, the world, because we just observe that from the sidelines and just waiting for that for that was going to happen. Of course, there is uh, some support from the US, from European Union, from uh, other countries, but uh, the Ukrainians are alone on the battlefield and everything may happen in the coming days, not maybe in the coming hours even, because the attack is very ferocious and terrible. So hopefully we'll be able to solve all of those problems that you mentioned, but uh, it's not likely to happen very often. So it's very difficult to understand and explain, actually, after having two world wars in uh, the last century, to have Balkan war, war, which was very also ferocious and uh, had a very uh, a huge number of victims. And right now the situation is completely without any, any reason and it's very difficult to explain and understand what's going on not so far away from us. Yeah. Thank you very much. What is one thing you think that we can learn? Because Dr. Frank is asking us to look at the developing nations getting support from more developed nations. And do we need to increase the trust levels to enhance it? What can we learn from the, uh, the good and the bad way of transferring the necessary support to, from one nation to the other? Maybe that, um, Sanita, would you like to go first? Just to give a uh, learning experience. I mean, uh, the Western Balkan uh, case scenario is very much, I don't know, straightforward and very much uh, simple, uh, especially after the 19th, after the, po the uh, post-communist regime, uh, all our six Western Balkan countries were facing more or less the same problems. Having in consideration even the geographical position, it's kind of in the border between uh, West and the East, and definitely always being present in the, let's say, uh, big powers or big countries, trying to influence one from the West and one from the East. But the pattern, uh, as I see it now, it's clearly toward, um, uh, especially in the processes of European uh, Integration Union. So it's definitely uh, toward the West. But still, I cannot say that there is not presence, especially in some countries, like uh, in Serbia, for example. It's very, uh, the, the, the presence of, um, of Russia is very present. I mean, it's in the banking, it's in the uh, TV. Uh, they are Russian TV and vice versa. Serbian TVs have their cable TVs both jointly into the respective, let's say, um, TV, national TVs uh, uh, channels. They have kind of even this association with the bigger Yugoslavia versus bigger Albanian. And definitely it's much more, let's say, pressure from uh, from Russia to keep and to strong the, the more the tights, especially with um, with Serbia. And when I'm saying Serbia, it has connection with uh, Serbians in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well or Serbians in um, 
uh, Montenegro. Meanwhile, uh, China. So um, if I see the skept- uh, I see a little bit of skepticism to say the truth in Western Balkan countries. I mean, uh, North Macedonia, Albania and Kosovo were much more aware of this situation and somehow made it clear, uh, even in the terms of investments, what kind of investments they need and they would like to have uh, in their countries, including even foreign direct investments. Um, China, uh, um, if I speak about China, was much more um, um, uh, into infrastructure development and uh, definitely even from uh, Western Balkan countries, politics and government, they were not seeing with such a skepticism the investments from, uh, from China. Um, you know, I think very well that all our countries are included in the initiative um, Belt and Road, uh, 16 plus 1, then with Greece, I think it's 17 plus 1 now, with the idea that um, uh, to develop all together kind of infrastructure that is connecting um, the routes between East and West and uh, some other corridors like with Piraeus in Greece, which is Beijing flagship project in the, in the region. And there are a lot of investments in the railway, mostly and infrastructure. Uh, Montenegro actually is heavily inhabited by our um, China investments. I think um, their debt ratio is increasing a lot and definitely they will have quite a problem even with the European uh, accession integration process, because because, uh, a lot of their um, GDP growth and a lot of their uh, interest payment and loan payments are going to are going to China. If you join uh, enters as it is now, because they are opening a lot of chapters, actually, there is remaining, I think, the last two. So they are quite near to the integration process with European, um, with European countries. Then it's a big uh, problem what to do with the debt that this country, Montenegro, is having with, uh, with China as well. Meanwhile, Albania, my country, was a little bit much more skeptical because... Um, isn't that we didn't try <laughs> to say the truth? Um, uh, they have been uh, building up or constructing a very much important uh, corridor, a road infrastructure, but they simply failed uh, to to deliver, and then um, we closed the contract with them. So automatically we become skeptical. Meanwhile, they are not um, delivering. They used to have the biggest shareholder of the um, one and the only one national airport in um, in Tirana, uh, Mother Teresa Airport, which is not anymore because some uh, uh, local um, uh, businessmen purchased um, their share uh, their shares in the um, in the business. So definitely, um, from Albania perspective, uh, much more is less this kind of um, east impact in um, uh, in our countries. Meanwhile, talking about trade and investment, definitely European countries are the biggest investors, being in terms of uh, imports and exports uh, happening in our region, and uh, as uh, foreign direct investors. Um, In Albania, which is a case that I know perfectly, Germany um, is one of the biggest investors in, um, in our country. Uh, Swiss, which is not you, is, in, is heavily investing and supporting, especially democratization and uh, and education. Uh, when I see, you know, you made the question, should we, yes or no, definitely, coming from a post-communist uh, regime with a very fragile economy, still our economies are very fragile. Like if we compare the GDP per capita in our countries, it goes far uh, Four or five thousand um, U.S. dollar per um, euro, pardon, uh, per, per per capita. Meanwhile, the average of uh, European countries goes 44, 45,000 euros. So the gap between our country, the gap even uh, in terms of economic uh, economical gap, but even democratization and building up institution and rule of law, the anti-corruption and stuff like this is huge. So definitely when I see that, yes, we need uh, we need Western countries to really help us and to support and to overcome all the obstacles that um, we are facing now, because uh, in some uh, it's pity what I read in some uh, even World Bank studies or international monetary monetary fund studies that we need at least 70 or 100 years more to really catch 
where the European countries are now. So if the European countries are moving faster, faster than this, then definitely we need much more years. So I see it as a kind of a, um, a must of this collaboration, of these investments in order to catch up uh, the development of, uh, of European countries, US, Australia, Canada, and so on and so forth, because we are living now in a global world. So the, despite the pandemic, it proves that, uh, yeah, still we are working together, be it even online or the trade between uh, countries in all. Um, the, um, uh, Senator, world. thank you very much. I, I think you gave us a very original perspective and a very decade by decade evolution. Uh, thank you very much for that. Joel, over to you. Yeah, no, that was brilliant. I, you know, I, I, a couple of thoughts are coming to mind as well in, in, in this discussion to try to add some layering to it as well. And, and first of all, um, you know, I, I, I did, I did want to, want to say to Darius, uh, uh, thank you to the Polish people for absorbing refugees. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's significant. And, and so in the, in a in a paradoxical way, um, we're kind of on the sustainable development goals. We there was a part that clearly was missing, which is the impact of security uh, on on these decisions and the financing, the infrastructure, who's paying for it. So of course the, the Nord Stream two uh, example may be the most present one in the public's mind, certainly in the United States, certainly in Germany, uh, uh, this this uh, idea of develop, and it's, of course, a developed economy, but it still needed gas. And so it was willing to accept security risks to get that gas. And now it's not. And uh, developing countries around the world, same dynamic, willing to accept development assistance at the cost of potential security um, uh, um, uh, debts to other countries. And we're seeing China call in some of those debts uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, now owning a port uh, because the, the Sri Lankan government couldn't pay back the, 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 the loan, uh, which is highly problematic. And, um, and, and I think it should be of deep concern around the world. This is, this is something that sustainable development, it's not sustainable if your security is undermined. Um, so those are a couple of thoughts on that. I, I wanted to also bring up the, the this question of democracy is integrated though into sustainability and the need for it. It's so obvious to people who have who work in development that uh, uh, non-democratic countries tend to be corrupt. <laughs> countries that don't have accountability mechanisms in general and certainly in their political environment um, tend to see funds siphoned off, you know, for the United States. Uh, we, we, we learned the hard way and poor Afghan uh, uh, the people learned the really hard way, the corruption endemic in, 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 in putting funds in. I mean, there's so many examples, uh, but what we're looking at right now in the case of Russia, as an example, is a, a kleptocratic, country where an elite set of oligarchs stole from their own people to tens of billions of dollars and tens of billions of dollars. And they have no accountability at all to the people who are completely um, misinformed about what the head of their country is doing in their name. And um, that failure to uh, help post-Soviet Russia move to a democratic culture uh, and governance structure is coming back now. We like to say coming back to bite us is sort of yeah. the the way. It's really obvious how that failure, whomever, however it was, uh, it, it was a failure. So I think that this question of demo this, this question of having democracy and security issues integrated into development planning and investment in infrastructure, trade, you name it, that has to happen. We we can't. Um, there's a word we use in, 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 I'm sure it's a creative word around the world, but we call it in, in our government bureaucracies. Uh, if, if one part of an agency doesn't talk to another part or one agency doesn't talk to another agency, we call it stovepiping. So we can't live in stovepipes. Uh, uh, development is an integrated uh, activity. 
And and development itself doesn't live separate from the security world, but it kind of has been in its theories over the last number of years. And I think I think that that has made it less realistic, uh, and we're seeing it now. So poor Russians, um, I, I feel for the Russian people because now all of a sudden their economy is disconnecting or disconnected from the global economy, uh, largely as a result of a security decision by their leader. And I'm trying to say that diplomatically. Um, and so where's their development? It's going backwards. It's going backwards. It's going further and further backwards. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that if we if we want a global economy that pr- creates development, we have to address security and democracy issues at the front end. Uh, and we can't we can't put them to the side. And that doesn't it, that doesn't mean we have an easy solution, but it also does mean that those are critical components uh, uh, to to real development that is sustainable. And the last thing I'll say, if I may, on our political environment here in Washington about the Nord Stream 2 situation, there was for a number of months pressure from our far right political community to have President Biden sanction Nord Stream 2, sanction Germany and cut it off, stop the project. That was sort of the blunt instrument. And and um, for people who care about development, we understand that one can't force another country's decision and have it work. It has to come from within, from the bottom up. And so Biden was more delicate in how he approached it diplomatically. And eventually the Germans made their own decision. And not only did they make that decision, they made a whole host of other decisions. And it is a, it is a sustainable decision now. Uh, they're not going backwards anymore. That would not have happened if we had tried to impose it. And I think this is a lesson for development overall. Ultimately, decisions must come from those who are most affected by those decisions. It, it can't be imposed. It, there has to be uh, uh, a commitment, uh, uh, a, a perception from those who are affected, those who are being um, uh, identified as, as the targets of the development assistance. They have to be driving the discussion. But we also have to make sure that we're keeping very clear eyed on um, ensuring that the security questions and the democracy questions and the governance questions are very central to to that, um, lest we have what we have right now, which is thank you, Joe. Back. Thank, thanks, thanks. Uh, that's that's a lot to digest. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> so a lot a lot going on in our uh, ecosystem and the world. Uh, and that is over to you, please. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Bagheera said that it's really great that Joe Biden is the president of the United States right now. It's like difficult to even imagine uh, if we had another option. So it's, it's, it's hard, as I said, it's hard to imagine what could uh, happen. So actually, two references to uh, what was uh, said. The first thing is, I think that the Western Union and the same the United States were lulled in the false sense of security for the last 20 years. And we remember what Barack Obama did that was a uh, uh, risk policy. So we start again. We start a new policy, new policy uh, concerning the uh, Russia. What was just from the perspective, uh, maybe not wrong, but it should be considered more careful. That's the first thing. So the second thing is about Germany. So that Germany worked and acted in the, a very similar way. That, it, that they called it Ostpolitik, which means the Eastern policy. They didn't want to be involved in any conflict. They wanted to appease Russia. That was the fear of appeasement and so on. Of course, they were involved in uh, with their money in big investments in Russia. So we have to remember that after Second World War, uh, Germany helped Russia develop their industries, their main industries, and so far, like the big uh, German corporations, the big German firms are involved in Russia, like. Uh, pass like Siemens, and they've got great number of assets with, uh, with a huge value over there. So that was the reason that Germany was so resistant to implement the sanctions that were offered and put on the table by the states and by the European Union. So we have to remember that, but it has changed like two or three days ago. And uh, seeing that what was what was happening in Ukraine and what was what's happening right now, they decided that. Uh, uh, respecting for values and sharing the same values, which are the fundamentals of the, our Western culture, is more important than money, what should have been done like at the beginning uh, of the entire conflict. And of course, and the third thing, we have to understand and remember that we've got a big player on the market right now. It's a big lender as well, China, what our Albanian friend 
as said. Of course, my opinion is that uh, road and belt initiative, it's not a, a question of economy. Uh, it's mainly a political question. So undoubtedly, being involved in more than 130 countries, it's not a question of economy. It's a question of uh, political advantage that they are trying to gain. So it cannot be an element of uh, economy just putting a military hold, for example, in Djibouti. It doesn't make any sense. It's not that. It's a control of the canal. And that's why we should also be aware of that fact that uh, taking money from China, it's like a huge obligation, not only in economic terms, but one day they will come over and say, of course, you can pay later your debt, but you get to do something for us. And that's, that's, a, very simple, that's a very simple policy. I'm uh, really surprised that uh, some governors, governments, uh, presidents of the countries do not understand the situation they are, tra- they are involved in, they are actually tempted into. But that's the question whether we, we can call it temptation, because if you are able to think logically, you shouldn't have any problem to understand what kind of trap this is set by uh, Chinese people. Of course, the, que- the question is whether uh, we should uh, help. So actually, we should as well learn from the history. There are many bad and good examples of distributing the aid and distributing the help. I'll give you one, for example, exam- example. In 80s, we've got, uh, and 70s actually, in uh, eight, uh, 78, we had uh, Vietnam and Nicaragua. They were given exactly pretty much the same help, the same aid from the uh, third countries. So the Vietnam uh, used that in the proper way. They were not admitted uh, by the World Trade Organization until 2007 and Nicaragua was admitted in 1995. Nicaragua uh, also had a very preferential rates uh, when we talk about the uh, commercial channels uh, with the United States and Vietnam was uh, mostly isolated because as far as I remember that was embargo uh, imposed by the United States until 1994. And actually they were able to uh, take um, to come over all those hurdles and obstacles and just uh, have some level of prosperity, let's say. And at the same time, for example, Nicaragua didn't do their best and actually they are lost and embezzled all the money they received. So we've got many examples like Malawi, and they were given a huge amount of money as, as aid, and actually all of that was embezzled and taken by and the uh, members of the government, and that was a, a huge uh, pr- prosecutor's proceeding after that. And I think that the guy who just tried to follow that was uh, shot. So, so we should also learn from the history, but also we shouldn't be thinking about our perspective and our narrative as a donor. We should be thinking about the narrative and the situation of the beneficiary, because what's the very important thing? Very important thing is that institutional help and institutional ability to absorb absorb the financial the, the financial means. Yeah, that's the main thing. When we are sh- sure that we can do something, let's do it. And w- when we we are sure that uh, those means though this financial aid will be distributed in the proper way, of course we of course we can do that. But that's also the question: What does it mean uh, an aid today? Because we shouldn't be talking only about money. That's that's not the thing. Actually, we've got many fields of exclusion. Uh, of course, economic exclusion is the main one, well known uh, for many, many decades. But also, for example, we've got digital exclusion. We've got uh, healthcare exclusion. And we should be working on that. Let's let's look at, the, for example, the pharmaceutical sector. Like 90% of all, all researches uh, is... Uh, carried out in Europe or in the United States. And we've got, for example, so many endemic endemic illnesses all over the world. And nobody works with that. So it's like very, very strange because they are not given proper instruments just to be able to carry out some investigations, uh, some researches and so on. So we should be also concentrating not only on the donor if we want to, but the question is about how the beneficiary will will deal with those. Um, and the thing is, we should concentrate only on money. We should concentrate on the instrument, which are very important to increase the level of well-being 
well-being in those countries. Also, maybe access to the markets. Also, we got to do something about uh, labor for uh, work, uh, labor force. Not only the highly qualified, but but also those with low qualifications. There are many, many questions and many, many channels that we can use to help them. Not only financial aid today is very is the most important thing. Thank you very much, Teres. I mean, such concrete uh, experts uh, uh, you all are contributing to this particular uh, problem. We can go on so long on this, but just imagine that we have a young generation coming and they have to learn from you to deal with these situations in the future. And uh, for that, we have very little time. We got five minutes, but please uh, give your perspective uh, about your experience. So being mentored by somebody that touched your life or how you are mentoring at the moment, just a very important uh, experience that you share. And one book that touched you that may touch somebody else. Because right now we are talking about transformation, transforming world. We need to be conscious, adaptive, uh, pioneering leaders to take action for future. So anything that comes from your heart and experience, I like the next gen to be aware of this and we'll promote this. So uh, uh, please, Senita, over to you. And we have like four minutes, just go quickly uh, mentioning your experience, please. So quite, uh, I think this is the toughest questions of all the, <laughs> all the others before. <laughs> Definitely, I mean, I don't know. I've been having a lot of mentors in my life and uh, the hero is my father for sure. The rest, it's, um, it's um, I don't know, during our journey, we meet a lot of people. I don't have one kind of, uh, I don't know, one ideal which I follow. The ideal will be me tomorrow better than I'm today. Mm -hmm. And then uh, me of today, of tomorrow be better than, uh, I don't know, me in a couple of five years or 10 years and serve as a good example to my kids first, to my three children, and then... Uh, to start from the family and then to try to, you know, improve lives of anybody who is uh, around uh, around you. Uh, you are remembering me uh, 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 a say of Mother Teresa was saying that if you want peace in the world and then you start loving your family first, and if you don't love the family first and, you know, people around you, then what you are doing. Perfect. Meanwhile, about the, what we have been discussing and as, as even Joel is here, you know, kind of a... a, a, a communication between European and uh, America, I would love to see much more cooperation between you and uh, US um, uh, aid assistance or all the initiatives, be it and included all even the uh, members of NATO as a transatlantic uh, uh, Atlantic, um, uh, association. There are Senator, a lot thank you. Let's stop there because we got three minutes. Uh, Darius, over to you, uh, a, a mentor and a book. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think it's like very difficult to say that one person was a, a mentor. So I think when when we are really young, we do not understand exactly what's going on uh, uh, around us. And I mean that that we don't have a ab great ability of self reflection, and that's the problem. So just uh, thinking about the things which had uh, which happened in the back, and from the perspective. Uh, when and where we are right now, I'm sure that all of us have got feeling that some things, some, some things should have been done differently. But that's, that's a question of uh, gaining experience during our lifetime and we shouldn't do uh, anything and one about book, one book and, and talk, talk, Talking about mentors, I think that many people just contributed to uh, who I am right uh, now and I would like to thank them uh, all. And it's very difficult to say and single out one person that had the biggest impact on my life and my development. Oh, thank you, Joel. With you, uh, the what popped to mind right away was uh, Don Fabio Garita Morales, who was a farmer with whom I lived during the Peace Corps during my training. Who, in my first night, with half a thumb and no front teeth, pointed at me and said, "We are all equal. We are all equal. You might be an American. I'm I'm a, a farmer here in, in Costa Rica, but we are all equal." And that has stuck with me forever throughout all of these experiences and. I hope the moment now for our young generation, I have three children as well, and they are so connected globally, uh, that, that equality of literally we are equal. There is no difference between any of us as human beings. Uh, that, that really penetrates the way that we operate in the world. That is so essential. I think one thing, if I may say, out of the Ukraine situation that has been so clear is how human and personal it is now because of social media and the, all of that. And, and it's, it's so searing and painful. And, and we have to 
flip that into the positive, but we have to totally respect the fact that we are all equal people. And that has, that is, um, that is a driving force for me uh, personally in all of these issues, uh, respect for each other as completely equal. That's Thank crucial. you very much. Thank you. I think just from my perspective, reflection brings realization, may bring transformation and resonance if we have the right tools in our toolbox. And through the life, we are born to our mothers, uh, grow into our family, make friends, choose, wait, 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 make and choose friends, and then you are finding your colleagues, then your acquaintances, and the everyone around you. And I think in this journey of adapting and learning, we are mentoring one another. We are then becoming peer to each other. Then we are looking at situations or deals or opportunities or challenges. And then we look to reach out to many because it's in our heart to add value together. So I look forward to expanding on our energy and wishing through collective hearts to everyone that is going through difficulties and hopefully better days will come uh, through the uh, shared vision, values, and the voice that we can do. Thank you very much. And thanks to Dr. Thank Frank you. getting us together. Yes. And we'll go from uh, better days uh, ahead. Thanks very much, uh, audience that joined Thank us. You. We appreciate Thank it. You. And we look forward to meeting you in person as the Friends of Horaces. I will now uh, wish you a great day and continue enjoying the coffee breaks and the next sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All the best.